Usain Bolt, Bonnie and Clyde, and Jonah. What do they have in common? Yeah, you heard that right. Usain Bolt, Bonnie and Clyde, and Jonah. What do they have in common? They're all world-class runners who ran with a purpose. Usain Bolt, if you go to his website, it says he's one of the greatest athletes to ever live. Just ask him, he'll tell you. And in his heyday, he was breaking every sprinting record there was. And when they asked him, why do you run? He said, I run to be the fastest man on the face of the earth. And he was until age caught up with him. And then this last summer, the unthinkable happened. His 200 meter record was broken. And yet if you look at Usain Bolt, you can't deny he was one of the greatest runners who has ever lived. But so were Bonnie and Clyde, right? <laughs> they weren't world-class sprinters, but they were really good at running from the law. What started with a stolen car and continued with robbing everyone and everything in their path across multiple states including countless shootouts and close calls, was 21 months of incredible running until it all came to an end when they were shot and killed. But no one can deny that they knew how to run. And they ran, why? To stay alive and out of prison. But we can't forget the most infamous runner of the Bible, Jonah. His story is the story of a man running from God. But here's my question for us this morning. If Usain Bolt ran to become the fastest man on earth, Bonnie and Clyde ran to stay out of prison and alive, why on earth would Jonah run? More specifically, why on earth would Jonah run from God? This becomes even more head-scratching when you consider that before the book of Jonah ever started, Jonah was already a successful prophet. For you see, in the days of King Jeroboam, God came to Jonah and called him to go to King Jeroboam, to go to the people of Israel and call them to repent. So Jonah went. He stood in God's place and he spoke God's message to God's people. And something incredibly rare happened in that moment. They actually listened. And they repented. And God used Jonah to restore their borders and to save them from their self-inflicted pain. You have to understand, Jonah was the man. So what would lead Jonah, a successful prophet, to want to run from God? It's this tension we see building in these opening verses of the book of Jonah. Check it out. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. So God comes to Jonah and says, My guy, you had a successful run before. Now I have another mission for you. We're going to accomplish great things together. Now, before we go hating on Jonah, we have to stop and we need to give respect where respect is due. For here's what we see in Jonah chapter one. Jonah knew God. Jonah had a relationship with God. God spoke to Jonah and Jonah recognized his voice and his calling. Let's be honest this morning. How many of us would love to hear the audible voice of God in our lives? How many of us would love to have crystal clear clarity on exactly what I'm supposed to be doing right now at this moment in time? <laughs> Jonah had that. Jonah knew God. He heard the voice of God and recognized God's calling upon his life. We have to respect that. What was the problem? The problem wasn't that God called Jonah. Jonah. The problem was what God called Jonah to do. It's like back when we were in school, for some of us, those were a few years ago. And when we sat in school, we wanted to help the teacher, right? 
And so anytime the teacher would ask for help, what did we do? <laughs> right? We threw our hand in the air before even hearing what the teacher needed help with. And in that moment when the teacher finally called our name and we got to be the helper, we found out that we just volunteered for the task that we never wanted to do in the first place. <laughs> because there's 10 other things we'd rather do. We'd rather take the sick kid to the office. We'd rather be the line leader. We'd rather take the note to the librarian. And yet we just volunteered to go and smash together all of the erasers and get all the chalk out. And our clothes were going to be covered in chalk for the rest of the day and we were going to be coughing for a week. Anyone else remember that? <laughs> and we're going, what did I get myself into? And this is Jonah. The problem wasn't that God called Jonah to be a prophet. He'd been there, done that, and bought the t-shirt. The problem was what God was calling Jonah to do. For you see, God was calling Jonah to leave the comforts, to leave the familiar of home, and go to a place outside of Israel. For most of the prophets of the Old Testament, they spent their entire career living and doing ministry in Israel at home with the people they knew. But this time God says, Jonah, you can't stay home. I need you to get up and I need you to go to Nineveh. And Nineveh was the very last place he would ever want to be. For you see, the city of Nineveh was the great military capital of the, the Assyrian Empire. A lot of armies would go in and defeat a city, plant their flag there and say, we're in control now. The people who lived in Nineveh took it to a whole other level. For you see, the people living there were war criminals. They took the, the violence from here to here. They did senseless acts to women and children. They were the terrorists of the ancient world, inflicting terror on an entire region. And so when God calls and says, I want you to go to Nineveh, Imagine God calling you today to say, I want you to go to a town that's filled with terrorists or the drug cartel, and I want you to step into that moment. I want you to step into that place, their home turf, and I want you to tell them what they're doing is evil. How many of you want to sign up for that journey? <laughs> How many of you think that journey will be successful? Right? At best, he'll be laughed out of town. But for Jonah, this was even worse. For you see, this was personal. For Jonah didn't just see the evil of the Ninevites on the evening news. He saw it with his own eyes. Jonah most likely had friends and family members who had fallen victims to the Ninevites. The evil was real. The pain was personal. The greatest source of pain and fear in his life was the people of Nineveh. And so imagine in that moment being called. This was personal. And the reality is, going to tell them that the evil they're doing is wrong was most likely a death sentence. But to give them grace and hope was a slap in the face to everyone he had ever known and loved. And what's building in this moment is a clash between Two dramatically different hearts. On the one hand, we have the heart of God, right? It's a, the heart of God that is righteous and holy and hates evil. And yet, on the other hand, desires for all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. Within the heart of God, each and every person matters. No matter how crooked or messed up, each and every person has value. For God, there is no one who is too lost, too broken, or too far gone. For God, there isn't a person that has ever walked the face of the earth that wasn't created in the image of God and of infinite value. So much so that when Jesus came, there is not, has not been, nor will ever be a person that Jesus didn't consider worth dying for. And it's easy, easy to hear this and go, well, yeah, Jesus died for everybody, but we have to make this personal. Jesus died for you. 
He died for George, he died for Harry, he died for Sally, he died for Mary, he died for Jonah, he died for Nineveh. And there's no one who is too far gone beyond the love and the power of God. And yet on the other hand, we have the heart of Jonah. And in Jonah's heart, there are some people who are worth saving and there are some people that are just too far gone. There are some people who are worthy of the grace and the mercy and the love of God. And there are some people who just aren't worth it. There are some people who are savable and there are some people who aren't even fixable. There are some people who are worth his breath and just ask him, he's already decided who those people are and he can save God a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of effort and he can stay home and say, God, they're not gonna listen. God, it's not gonna work. Nineveh just isn't worth it. And here's my fear. How many of us have done the very same thing as Jonah? We've decided in our own minds who is and who isn't worthy of the grace of God. We've decided in our own minds who's savable, who's fixable, who's within the grasp of God's grace and God's mercy and God's power, and we've decided who's beyond grace and beyond his saving. For let's be honest, we've been burned and we've been bruised. We've been hurt. And honestly, there's some people that we've just flat given up on and say there's no hope for them. And in those moments, we've made ourselves judge and jury, deciding who is and who isn't worthy of the grace of God. We've made ourselves judge and jury, deciding who is and who isn't worthy of the love and the saving of God. And there's some people who have so badly hurt us that we've written them off as a last cause. And there's even people that we look at and go, if they're in heaven, I'm not sure I want to be there. And in those moments in life, we've decided who is and who isn't worthy of grace. And my fear is in all of our deciding, we've lost sight of the true essence of what grace is. For grace has never been about the worthiness of its receiver. For grace is completely unearned and undeserved. Grace can't be earned or deserved or it wouldn't be grace anymore. And that's the thing that makes grace so both amazing and difficult for us to comprehend. It's unearned and undeserved. And there's no one who has ever received grace that has been worthy of the grace that they've received. Think about that for a minute. There's no one who has ever received grace who has been worthy of the grace that they've received. Do you know who else is included in that? That's us. For the essence of grace is that we get what we never deserved. We receive what we never earned. For grace brings love to the loveless and hope to the hopeless. Grace finds the lost, heals the broken, saves the unsavable, brings life out of death. Not because we've earned it or deserved it, but because when God looks at you, he says no one's too far gone. No one's too lost. No one's too broken. For the very heart of God, the very grace of God beats for the least, the lost, and the last. But there's another element of grace that we have to look at that I think we oftentimes lose sight of. God alone knows the full power of his grace to change hearts and lives. And when we go about deciding who is and who isn't savable, who is and who isn't worthy, we're losing sight of We don't know the power of God's grace, for God's grace can save anyone. God's grace has the power to save anyone. No one is beyond hope. No one is beyond saving. No one is beyond the power of God in their lives. 
And what's happening in Jonah 1 is where we have a clash that's coming. For on the one hand, we have God over here who has a heart for each and every person. Who looks at each and every person as someone who was made in his image of infinite value. Who looks at Nineveh and says, these are my people and my heart breaks for them. And on the other hand, we have Jonah going, they're not worth it. Why would I want to waste my time? Why would I want to give my life for that? So what do we do when our heart clashes with God's heart? What do we do when God disappoints us? What do we do when we disagree with what God does or what God says? For Jonah, the answer was simple. Check it out, Jonah chapter one, verse three. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. What does Jonah do? Jonah runs. God says, go up to Nineveh. He says, I'm going down to Joppa. What does Jonah do? He sells his home, he mortgages his future, he gets everything out of his 401k, he cashes out his savings account, he mortgages his future, he takes everything that he has at his disposal, he gets loans from family and friends and says, I want to buy not just a ticket to Tarshish, I want to buy the boat and I want to buy the crew because I want to be sure I get there. But where was Jonah really going? Go back to the text, verse 3. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish. Read that last line with me. Away from the presence of the Lord. Where was he really going? Scholars have struggled with this idea of Tarshish because honestly, outside of the Bible, there's not a whole lot we know about the ancient city of Tarshish. Historians have looked and said, well, we're not sure that Tarshish was a real city or not. And yet I think to engage that debate is to miss the entire point. Why? Was Jonah really going to Tarshish? Was Tarshish really his destination? No. Jonah was running to a place that doesn't exist. For Jonah was running from the presence of the Lord. Jonah was running to get as far away from God as possible. And he would do everything in his power, everything at his disposal, to get away from God. And yet what he found was, He was running to a place that doesn't exist because there's no place that we could ever run where God is not. There's no place that we could ever run from the reign of God and the presence of God for that place doesn't exist. I think in many ways David figured it out the hard way. Here's how David put it, Psalm 139. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven... You are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. What did David figure out? Where can you run from God's presence? Nowhere. Because that place doesn't exist. For there's nowhere we can run from the very presence of God. For every step of the way, God is with us. And the greatest desire of God's heart is for you to be right there with him as his child. So I don't know if you're coming here today and you're going, man, life is as it should be. Life is perfect. Life is how I always dreamed it. I couldn't wait to get 112 day in the middle of September. (laughs) If that's you, God's right there with you even in the 112th. I don't know if you come here today and your, bad, your life's a bad country song. You lost your wife, your truck broke down, and your dog died. If that's you, God's right there with you. I don't know if you're coming here today and you're going, I'm not sure if this God thing's for real. I'm not sure if God really exists, but if that's you, let me tell you something. There's never been a breath you've taken or a beat of your heart when God hasn't been right there with you. And I don't know if you come here today and you're ticked at God. 
You're upset because he's not playing according to your rules. He's not saying what you want him to say. He's not doing what you want him to do. And you're lacing up your Nikes to run with Jonah. If that's you, you cannot run God. For even in your running, God is right there running with you. And so the question for us today is, where are we running? Are we running from God or to his loving embrace? And if you're running from God, get used to the hamster wheel because you can run all day long and you're never gonna get where you're going. But even in your running on the hamster wheel, God's right there with you. Because there's nowhere we can go. That place doesn't exist where we can run from the presence of God. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and pray together. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as we come here today, we thank you for your heart. And we thank you that at times your heart is very different than ours. And we pray that you would mold and shape our heart to break for what breaks yours. We pray that you would give us eyes that could see people not as we see them, but as you see them. That as we see each and every person as one who's valued by you, because they're made in your image. Help us not to give up on people, even when it's hard. And Lord, help us, even in our running, to know that you run with us. And may our running run not away from you, but to your loving arms as we experience your grace and your healing and your love. We pray this all in the name of your son, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated. And at this time, we bring before God our tithes and offerings, knowing that God uses these to make an eternal difference in the lives of people in this place and around the world.
Let us pray. Gracious God, your mercies are new to us each and every morning. Your heart is for each and every person. Help us to see others as you see them. Open our eyes to the unearned, unmerited grace that you have poured into us. Fill us with thankfulness and give us a willing spirit to answer your calling upon our lives, whatever that might be. Lord, you are the King of kings and Lord of lords, and we ask as the one who is over all that you would be with our country. We truly are one nation under you. Be with those that you have given positions of leadership. Give them wisdom and discernment as they make decisions, that they might work for the good of all people. Be with those who have been tasked with keeping us safe and defending our nation. Grant them courage and safety as they carry out their important work. Jesus, you are the Lord and giver of life, but you are also the God who brings healing. We ask today that you would be with all who are sick and hurting, especially today we remember Tammy, Carol, Marsha, Susie, Ruth, Brittany, Reed, and those we name aloud now. Give to each your perfect healing. Be also with the doctors, nurses, and medical teams that are often your agents of healing in our world. Give them wisdom and compassion as they carry out their work. We pray also for the people of Morocco who experienced a deadly earthquake, taking the lives of so many people. We can hardly begin to imagine the destruction and grief that has rocked that country. Our heart breaks for them and with them. Surround them with your loving arms and give them peace in the midst of the unthinkable. Be with all who seek to give help and assist in the process of restoration. All this we ask in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Glory. Please stand with me. When Jonah was running, was he alone? No. Every step of the way, God was with him. Wherever you're running to this week, God runs with you. And you go with him. And he sends you forth with his blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and fill you with his perfect peace. Amen. Amen. We sing together.
God.